Thank you, Frank. Uh, the radio commercials are, have been uh, affectionately labeled as uh, I have a face for radio, so uh, that's a, a natural fit. So uh, good to see everybody. Uh, tell me, uh, show of hands, uh, maybe a comment or two. Uh, how's today been so far? Yeah. Yeah, well, the exit, Nat, is right there, so you can go ahead and leave if, if you know, if it's not working out for you. Uh, no, it's, uh, that's, that's great to hear. I know there is, uh, I'm sure, just a, a, a great sense of enjoyment to uh, be around others and have the opportunity to uh, not only network, but listen to some great speakers. Uh, so, so really, really glad to, to be with, here with y'all uh, this afternoon. And uh, I guess, you know, this is not going to be necessarily about roofing uh, or, or anything related to us, but I will give you just an ounce of backdrop. Uh, you know, Frank nailed it. I was uh, somehow, some way, a graduate of the University of Georgia in 1997. That was uh, the fastest degree they ever sent out because they were like, if we can just get him off campus, that'll, uh, that'll be a win for us. I was a risk management and insurance major, uh, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with that. had a friend, fortunately, who said, uh, you should major in risk management and insurance because your friends will all major in marketing and finance and management, and they will not get a job. Uh, they will be job hunting, and with a risk management degree from Georgia, you will, you will be employable. So uh, true to his word, I had a job before I uh, graduated with an employee benefits firm. I uh, worked there for about 20 seconds and knew that I was not going to be doing that very long. Uh, and just sort of uh, stumbled, I guess is, is the way to say it, into the roofing industry. Uh, had a friend that worked for a roofing company in Savannah. And uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but uh, Savannah was on the water and I was young. And he sold a good story about why I should come talk to his employer uh, went down there, talked to them, got hired, and entered uh, the roofing business. And, and I had no construction background whatsoever. Uh, my father was a career high school football coach. My mom was a career educator. Uh, I, I probably knew less about roofing than uh, most of you in the room and uh, just kind of fell in love with the industry. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, kind of how I ended up in roofing. I uh, met my wife. She lived up here uh, while I was in Savannah. We dated from afar, and when we got engaged, uh, we kind of stared at each other and were like, what next? Because uh, this isn't going to work from three and a half hours away. And uh, she had a great job at the time, was a pharmaceutical rep, had to live in the territory that she worked in, and that made the decision easy for me to move to Athens. And the next day, I started bone dry roofing. And that was in January of 2003. So there is the quick version of, uh, of, of how I got to, to bone dry and got here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, stronger traction. Um, if there is anyone who is familiar with the book Traction by Gino Wickman, anybody? Anybody know that book? Uh, that has been a really integral part uh, to our success story. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Talk about um, the principles in traction, what we've done to utilize that book with our growth over the past several years, uh, and try to weave in uh, kind of the personal side of what uh, an operating system like traction uh, has done for, for myself personally uh, at kind of in tandem with what that has looked like uh, inside the walls of our organization. With that said, uh, I really would love for this to be as interactive as you guys want it to be. Um, there are really no secrets in, in, in our story. Uh, nothing off limits. So if there are questions along the way, if there is something you want to know that I glaze over and just kind of blow past, then by all means, uh, raise a hand, stand up, throw something. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, talk, about, uh, we'll talk about anything you guys want to talk about. It is, uh, it is really important for me that uh, this hour for anybody in here is, uh, is beneficial to you. Um, I know a lot of people in here 
a lot of familiar faces and a lot of people I would love to just have a beer with and catch up with and be friendly with and that's all great and fine and good uh, but for this hour uh, I, do, I do not want anybody to leave here not feeling like they have taken something away. So whatever I can do to help with that, I'm certainly glad to do it, and that's really the, really the intent. So um, I always get the question in any kind of, uh, in any kind of speaking engage, engagement of what do you wish you would have known uh, starting out? Uh, what, what do you wish now looking back from the perspective of 2020 back to 2003? What do you wish you would have known? I always say the same thing. I don't know. I don't know what that thing is, but I always, I always say, I know what I'm glad I didn't know. I'm really glad nobody ever stopped me or sat me down as I was beginning an entrepreneurial journey and said, hey, you need to understand that five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road, if you're ever statistically lucky enough to even make it there, you need to understand that your day-to-day -day world will not look like it looks day one of starting a roofing company. I I'm so glad nobody ever told me that because that would have been really confusing. And it probably would have been enough of a system shock to make me just go, I do I really want to do this? Because uh, what I knew was the world that I had been in, right? I mean, I knew the roofing side of the day-to-day -day habits, the behavioral things I had been doing for the past several years that kind of gave me the confidence to step out and start a business. And in my mind, when I did that, I think I just assumed that that would repeat itself day after day and the enjoyment I had up to that point would maybe grow because I'd be doing it for myself. But beyond that, I had given no thought to what three years, five years, ten years down the road would, would look like. And if somebody who knew would have said, you know, you need to understand this reality that if you're able to survive the first year, which statistically you won't, the odds are very slim, but if just say you do, and if you're able to make it to year three after that, which statistically there's really no chance that you will, but say you do, and then on to five, ten years down the road, your day-to-day -day reality will look completely different. That would have been really, really difficult for me to digest, and it probably would have been enough to halt my enthusiasm for going out and trying to start something on my own. That reality is as true today as it was then, and that is something that we can talk about as, as much as you guys want, that one of the really big lessons learned in our journey and in my own personal journey has been that reality that our success and our growth as an organization and my growth individually, both personally and professionally, has been an acknowledgement and a recognition that my roles and responsibilities, the things that I do day to day, have changed and evolved as our organization has changed and evolved. And that's, uh, I don't know that that is necessarily something that everyone understands, appreciates, and certainly is able to lean into and embrace in the journey of growth that is a growing business and a growing organization. In a lot of ways, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's really counterintuitive, right? I mean, we're, we're in an entrepreneurial sense, you know, hair on fire, whatever we have to do to make success happen, to make today happen, to make the next deal happen. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like the message around that is faster and better and more aggressive, and that's the entrepreneurial spirit. And, you know, I, I, I'm saying that I don't necessarily think any of that is untrue. I just think that somehow balanced in all of that is this reality of patience and long-term and stick to and I, this concept of delayed gratification. Um, I read something not long ago that was, uh, was identifying three behavioral characteristics of uber-successful people. <clears throat> and one of the things that really successful people 
all had in common was this understanding of delayed gratification. Was this just sort of embracing that although something was good today and there was an opportunity that, uh, that came their way and you know, there was more money today than there was yesterday and there was greater opportunity today than there was six months ago, that they, they did not view that as success and they did not view that as a license to just spend and, uh, and, and buy the next toy or whatever. They, they, they understood at their core that delaying gratification was the price of long-term success. And I really think that, uh, I, I really think that, that, is, that is true for anything. And, and, and again, in, in, in this entrepreneurial sense, uh, we, we know fast and, and, and busy and all of those things, but we also know, and life has taught us from an early age, that anything worth having, right, is, is, is a function of investment of energy and time and things maturing and things marinating. And so it's really, although a, although a, 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 a counter-intuitive uh, thought to the entrepreneurial spirit, it's really embedded deeply in us, and we, I think, know at a core level that, that those things are true. Um, but embracing the reality uh, that change is inevitable and that navigating change is one of the keys to long-term success, change and uncertainty, uh, right? Those are the things that are so difficult day-to-day -day in growing a business, um, and again, the kinds of things that, hey, if your day is not going to look like it looks today, tomorrow, and the changes that go with that, those are really, uh, you know, the, the uncertainties and the confusing uh, 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 concepts that I think make it very difficult to grow a business, uh, and especially from the sense of a business that um, maybe you don't want to be the day-to-day -day operator of. Uh, that you don't want to be the one receiving every phone call, that you don't want to be the one receiving uh, or, or going on every appointment. I mean, if, if, if what you're wanting to grow uh, is scalable, uh, for us, that has meant offices in other markets, offices in other locations. Um, you know, the reality was we were going to have to embrace a concept of we can't do, I can't do everything myself. And I think, oddly enough, that was the thing that maybe early on that I fell in love with um, that was an unknown. Uh, I, I fell in love with being an employer. And that was, a, that was not something that I knew going into, uh, going into starting my own business. Um, I, I, I am passionate about what we do. I am passionate about the roofing industry. Uh, but at the end of the day, what I'm, what I'm really passionate about is the team around us and growing opportunity for others and bringing other people in. Sam Perry is in this room. Sam works with us. And I don't know and have great friends like Sam if we are not cultivating an environment of growing and developing people. Sam was a career educator and coach prior to coming into the roofing industry. There's story after story after story of guys like Sam uh, throughout our organization. And, uh, and that was really what I fell in love with and what was really uh, the motivator for me to uh, you know, transition us from, a, from a, uh, a one location small business to multi-location uh, continued growth, continued opportunity creation for others. And again, that was just something that, uh, that I found out uh, along the way as I, as I started our journey. So any questions about that? Any questions about um, anything that, yes, sir? Yeah, yeah, I didn't. So that was easy. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, seriously, it was so, uh, and it's a great question because what we do is relatively capital intensive, right? I mean, it's equipment and trucks and, uh, and especially back in 2003 when roofing was still a hot asphalt market, 
uh, which doesn't necessarily mean anything to you, but the smell that you have when you're like seeing road construction occur was the same smell that you used to smell when roofs were getting done. Uh, hot asphalt was the world of roofing for a long time until the roofing industry woke up one day and was like, uh, you know, nobody labor-wise wants to climb up on a roof and melt to begin with because it's so hot up there and then melt additionally because they're having to sling hot asphalt around. We've got to clean this industry up and green this industry up or we're not going to have a workforce, which is a whole other conversation for another day. But in 2003, those realities made the roofing industry very difficult to enter into because it was just capital intensive and it required some, some money. Um, I mentioned that I was uh, the, the son of a coach and an educator, which it could also be said uh, differently as I had no money. Um, and had not saved any money and was not really interested in getting an investor. Um, but what I knew from my past employment at a roofing contractor was a service model. Uh, I, I, I managed a service department for that roofing contractor. And so from a very early, uh, from, from, from really day one in the industry for me, I was out meeting and talking with customers and clients and growing a service department. And I knew that that was a, uh, that that was a replicable model, that we could do that anywhere. Um, it was the world I knew. Uh, that's how I started on day one. And it really allowed us to grow without necessarily having to invest a lot in equipment early on. Because with the service model, we were doing a lot of repair work, a lot of light maintenance, knowing that that would eventually lead to relationship roof customers, re-roof customers, new roof customers. Um, but in the very, very early stages, it just didn't require as much of the equipment and the, and, and the cash layout uh, that we would just sort of grow into and self-finance all that early on. Is that? Yeah, yeah sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure, that's a great question. Um, maybe you should ask them. They'd be like, uh, he didn't do any of that. Um, <laughs> that no, I, um, I, I tell you what, um, you know, it, it, every day with, with what I do is, a, is like a journey in self-awareness. Um, and I'm so thankful today, uh, more so than at any other time, that I grew up in a home with a father that was a high school football coach. And, and this has been a huge deal for me professionally, um, and it's taken a long time. I have always had this battle. Uh, Sam, you know this is true. We've talked about this. I've always had this just dilemma with why people don't just naturally know the things that were instilled in me at a really early age. Um, you know, the, the, the concept of perseverance and working through adversity and struggling through hard stuff, and all these like things that we grew up hearing nonstop from a football coach, right? Like, you know, yeah, you're, there's a difference between being injured and being hurt. You know, you're not, you go rub a little dirt on it. You know, these things that, you know, we just, we just dismissed as, well, that's just what, you know, the concept of working together as a team. Like, I, you know, I bang my head over this, this concept and how few people and fewer, right, fewer today than five, ten years ago, and same can be said ten years from now, how few people really understand that. I mean, we have found a direct connection with successful hires with kids that grew up playing team sports, football, basketball, soccer, Football, they, they, they understand and value teamwork. It's not all about me. It takes a bunch of people to deliver a final product. We have to figure out how to do this together. As a, again, things that, like I just assumed, you know, from the time you came out of the womb knowing, like people just don't know that. 
And it has really been a battle. It has really been hard for me for the better part of 18 years to reconcile that. And, you know, only, only recently have I really been able to kind of zone in on, oh, you know, th- this has to be taught to people who didn't grow up in that environment. Like, they just don't know. And it's different with, you know, doesn't mean they weren't active. I mean, it's different with golf, tennis, you know, individual sports. Like, there's a lot of stuff you can do that doesn't necessarily teach you anything about teamwork and, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to think that's it, that that is sort of the, uh, the, the gift that keeps on giving from what my father passed on to me and my sister and that we sort of bring into a work environment every single day is this just, you know, this is a, you know, a dysfunctional family that has to be able to work together and plow through adversity because there's a lot of people with a lot of hands in the mix to, to do what we do. Um, and for, for anybody, if I, if I missed that early on, so we, uh, we make money in three spaces uh, residentially, uh, which is as, as simple as it sounds. We re-roof houses, um, do some new construction residentially, very little, but, but re-roof houses. Uh, commercially, uh, we do a lot of institutional work, a lot of university system work, healthcare work, uh, banks, churches, uh, that type of stuff, uh, heavy industry. Uh, so commercially, residentially, and then service work. Uh, anything from, you know, there's a stain on my roof. I don't know why, but I think it's leaking to, you know, we're a big facility that just purchased a lot of new equipment in, inside, and it's got a bunch of penetrations that come through the roof, and those have to be flashed and so on and so forth. So those are the, those are the, the, the conduits that our services flow through is, are, those three, uh, are those three things. Yes, sir. Yeah, great question. Um, it, it was a, um, I, ha- I had a friend who had started a roofing company in another market. And um, he commented to me as I got started that there's a revenue size that will sort of be the, the, the ceiling for what you are able to do with just yourself and one or two others. Um, and it's merely a capacity thing. Every business has it, and every business is, is different with what that would look like. Um, but for us, that revenue was about $2.5 million. At, at $2.5 million of revenue, uh, you just got to a point where the wheels were kind of coming off the bus. It was just too many phone calls to handle, but also be out in the field looking after work and trying to, you know, it just, at two and a half million, it just was, a, it just began to, began to train wreck. And so when we got there, uh, I just knew that I wanted to keep growing. And I didn't know what the next ceiling was per se, but I just knew in order to move beyond two and a half million and keep growing that it was going to be growth by addition. And that was literally how we moved forward. And what I found is that that reality was the exact same, only different and larger and more moving parts uh, at about seven and a half, eight million. You know, you added by addition from two and a half to, you know, added an operations guy, another estimator, some support staff, so on and so forth, and now all of a sudden you could, you could handle up to the next, the next ceiling. And that, limit, and that ceiling for us was about, was about $8 million. And then that, So then it was another, just another cycle of growth by addition. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, great segue into the book Traction. <laughs> um, 
I, I arrived there uh, and quickly realized that in order for us to continue to grow, um, it meant letting go of a lot of things. Um, Wiring-wise, internal wiring-wise, um, I think maybe I'm just fortunately wired to be okay with that. Um, having great people around you certainly makes that easier to do. Um, you, you, if, you were, if you were in James's session in the, in the theater just a minute ago, you heard him say it. I mean, uh, you know, with great people, you can do anything, and uh, that is certainly the case for any organization in any industry. Um, you know, we talk about all the time. I mean, COVID has been a perfect example of that. Fortunately, we've been, we're an essential industry, and we've been able to keep working and uh, all that goes with that. But, you know, there was a period of time in mid-March where we didn't know if that was going to be the case or not. And fortunately, we have a lot of people who if we would have had to walk into the widget factory the next day and stop making widgets and start making wedges, they'd be fine with that. They'd be they okay, that's fine. Well, let's pivot and let's figure out what we have to do to navigate through this and come out on the other side, and that's what we'll do. And uh, that is, you know, that, that, that's pretty comforting when you are in growth mode and having to let go of things that maybe you have yourself done for a long time and the fear and the unknown of letting those things go and either having somebody that you trust enough to do it or finding and training someone that you trust enough to do it, it's a big deal and it's hard. Um, and it was why we embraced a, uh, uh, an internal operating system called Traction. And, you know, when, when stronger traction was, was talked about, I mean, this really was kind of the, was the idea of, like, what allowed us to grow beyond what maybe we ever thought we were going to. Um, it was the systematic way of doing things that come with an internal operating system. Um, now, traction in and of itself is, to me, no different than 20 other operating systems just like it. Um, the, maybe what made it unique was I thought it was really simplistic and really easy to understand, which translated to me and being really easy to communicate to others and hopefully being a little bit easily, more easily embraced by our organization. Um, and, and I think that's the case. Um, you know, we have been pretty traction pure in terms of using uh, the tools and using the framework of traction within the organization for uh, about six and a half years now. Uh, and it has, been, it has been the greatest, you know, one of the two or three greatest business decisions that we ever made. Um, and it, it provided a little bit of safety net, a little bit of uh, framework to allow us to let go of some of those things and kind of what that would look like and what support we needed around us to make that happen and have the confidence to do it and everybody focus on what they need to focus on to continue growth. Does that, that make sense? So the first thing that we hired for was really, we really, we really let go of sales and brought in other sales positions, knowing that right behind that would be the need to operationally catch up and be able to perform and supervise the work that those guys were selling. Um, and I would not change that. I think it was the absolute right decision. Uh, it has really been the model that we've continued to utilize um, as we've grown. Uh, and, and really, we kind of look at it now as uh, sort of both feet on the gas in both of those, in both of those silos. Uh, that as soon as we're hiring for sales and 
opportunity generation, we're, we're hiring and looking for operations to come along beside and support that new growth and manage that growth and so on and so forth. Um, but it is a, it is a never ending, it is a never ending cycle. Um, we are, we are always looking to find and hire great people. Uh, and that was, you know, somewhat of a mindset, uh, a shift in terms of just knowing that, that you, we just, we, we, we can't really turn that off. Um, because at any point, you know, somebody's, you know, if somebody leaves or, you know, somebody, family situation, they move, you know, you're just, you're just always in that, uh, that cycle of, of recruiting and, and finding and retaining talent. Um, it's, it looks different in, uh, it looks different in each of our, in, e in each, in each of our deliverables. Um, the, the residential side of what we do is a subcontract labor world. Um, and there's some reasons for that and some, uh, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, so in the, the, you know, how that translates to, to, to other activities, it's almost a, it's almost an outsourced, uh, labor uh, supply. Now, with that said, the the subcontract labor that we utilize really works exclusively for us, uh, just because we keep them busy all the time. Um, and so, that is part of what allows that to 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 work. Is is th those guys are around, and as things like that in a supply demand economy, those guys know who's busy and where work is, and if you've got work, they want to be there. I mean, so, you know, it just kind of, uh, it kind of works itself out. But it's a great question because our industry, and there's some other construction guys in the room that are, uh, you know, we sell labor. At the end of the day, that is what we do. Um, you know, what can our guys do it for versus what somebody else thinks their guys can do a project for. I mean, that is just the name of the game. And construction has, an, has a real labor issue. Um, there, there, there just are not tons and tons of people who are just lining up and going, you know, I think maybe starting tomorrow I want a roof. You know, I mean, so we have to have a pretty compelling story, which fortunately for our industry, I think we do. Uh, but, but, you know, you ask anybody who does what we do, our, our three biggest challenges are labor, labor, and labor. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of turnover in any industry if you don't have culture. You know, I mean it's uh, you know, I, I you know, people want to work where they feel they're wanted and where they feel listened to and where they feel like there's opportunity for growth. Um we we, we get that. And we understand that. And we also have a model of longevity. You know, there's, there's never been a part of our DNA that was about, you know, you know tomorrow we may do something different. You know, it's, this has been a marathon, not a, not a sprint. And it's always been, you know, we've always looked at it that way. Um, you know, as you grow, uh, no one person can necessarily champion that effort, right? I mean, it becomes, especially in, in other market locations, I mean, it becomes the organization and the people who have been there champion, championing that effort and telling those stories and everyone knowing what they are. Uh, we've got story after story after story of guys that started working for us as an hourly entry-level worker who are six-figure salaried employees now. Uh, 
that's an easy story to listen to. And, um, you know, if your supervisor is a guy who seven, eight, nine, ten years earlier was in the position that you are in, um, you know, that is a much more effective testimony to the culture than me telling you, hey, this can be you one day, right? Um, and it's a, but it's, but it's an, it's an everyday thing. Um, you know, it is a, it is a, a continual effort to, because you're right, there's a lot of turnover. Um, you know, I, I have friends who do what we do all over the country. We talk about this stuff, and, you know, I, I, I would, I would put our culture uh, up against most um, from a standpoint of, you know, we don't, we don't have the turnover that a lot of other companies deal with, and I think, I, I think that's a big part of it is it's just a, you know, it's just a really, uh, it's just a really important focus of, of, of what we do, what we look at. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and we are training those people, and we're supervising them with, with our supervision. So uh, we, we just have kind of embraced a model that, and this has been hard. I mean, this, is, this, is, this has been a, um, I mean, this is as much philosophical as it is financial. I mean, it's just, uh, but we just kind of look at labor as if they're doing work for us, they're our labor uh, without getting into labor law. Uh, if we're utilizing subcontractor labor, but we're supervising them, directing them, telling them what to do, da 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 they're our employee. In any version of that story, legally, they're our employee. Uh, we could, you know, if an incident happened, that's our employee. You're out there managing him, telling him what to do. And so part of it is we, we do train them um, to a standard that is, that is our standard. Uh, and we supervise them with, uh, with our own management. Uh, so that's one way. Um, and then the other way is everything else we do uh, is, is, is in-house labor. So there's, you know, there, there's a, uh, you know, from, a, from even a culture standpoint, I mean, what subcontract labor has become for us is a recruiting pool. Um, the, subcontract rea- the subcontract reality kind of birthed out of the downturn. Prior to 07, 08, 09, that, would, that was not, we didn't even know what subcontract labor was. Um, residentially, it probably had been around some, but in a commercial world, nobody, nobody even knew what that meant. Um, and so uh, you're reconciling all that was, you know, kind of learning on the fly and figuring it out. But over time, we have figured out that's a really good recruiting pool for us. Uh, talking to guys about, you know, why are you, why are you doing it the way you're doing it with no benefits, with no, you know, where you could be a full-time employee and have, you know, so that, that, is, that has become probably our most effective recruiting tool. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's probably two. Uh, it's probably estimating. Uh, you know, you bring someone in, and uh, they're going to get phone calls to go look at stuff and put pricing on stuff, but they don't have a background in roofing. Um, uh, it, that takes time. Uh, it takes investment. It takes training. It takes uh, so there. So the process of how that. Uh, occurs for us, it takes three years to kind of create a functional estimator. Um, that's a long time to invest in someone to, you know, Lee, you're, you're a general contractor. I would assume it's probably similar. I mean, there's just a lot of front-end investment that goes into somebody like that to have them knowledgeable enough to, to be able to put numbers out on your letterhead or in an email, you know, uh, on their own. Uh, the other is, is super, superintending, supervising. Um, you know, I think you can be a great supervisor and not know a lot about roofing. 
I really do. Um, but at some point, you know, that guy has to have a knowledge resource to go to. Um, and as, as much joking as I do about, you know, about our deliverable, uh, what we do, especially commercially, is really, really complex. Um, as building design and uh, structures have become uh, less uniform, uh, more creative, uh, more aesthetically pleasing, uh, those things are harder to waterproof than a square or a rectangle. And um, uh, the way stuff gets built today uh, is completely different than how it got built 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, which creates additional challenges just in phasing and integrating. And again, from a, from a teamwork standpoint, now you're team working with other entities outside your organization, a, a, a mason, a, a, a stucco contractor, uh, you know, there's just, you know, it's just a lot of moving parts, and that stuff has just gotten more and more complicated and requires more and more functional knowledge. Uh, again, managing people, supervising people, uh, you, can, you can not have roofing knowledge and do that just fine. I mean, you really can. Um, but it takes, again, I mean, it's a, just like it's a two, three-year commitment on, an est on the estimating side, same for superintending. So again, that, that foot on the gas of always bringing people in, you know, that, that is the cycle. You know, at any given time, I mean, you, you just, we just kind of look. We, we sort of people analyze, uh, which sounds really technical, um, but we sort of evaluate personnel quarterly, you know, and we look at that like, what is the tenure? What is the years? You know, who do we have, especially in those two, uh, in those two functions, estimating and supervising? And, and you know, are we greener than we want to be in a market? Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, but again, that is something that traction has allowed us to manage. To to give someone that has a high level of ownership, a high level of knowledge. To, to supervise and be responsible for leading and managing and holding accountable the, the people that are, that are underneath them in, in those boxes. Yeah. Um, again, I, 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 Chris, I think that's a wiring thing. Like, I've always... From, from early on, just kind of been able to power off the work stuff at the, at the, whether it's at the end of the day or, you know, and, and, and you never really power it off, right? I mean, everybody kind of understands that. Uh, but from a, from a standpoint of what's important, like, I was always, fortunately, my wife and I, um, had children pretty early on uh, in this in this entrepreneurial journey, and 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 just a big deal for me was I was going to be present with our kids. I mean that was just the deal, and whatever that meant, you know that was a priority to me. No different than you know exercise or or whatever you know a priority might be for someone else. That was just. And, and so I think it just set the stage really early on. That and I had a really understanding wife um, who was like, you know, I came home at 5 and was there till bedtime and kids in bed, and then I was back to the and, – and I had a wife that was really okay with that. Um, but, again, I mean, I was, you know, I was able to kind of make that work just like, uh, like anything else that we put a lot of value and, and, and priority on. Um, and so for me, that just, you know, then, then that began to translate over. Again, I never went into business to, to be the, I, I didn't want to be the, the, the only roofer. I didn't want to be the only one installing it, the only one going and looking at work. You know, that was, again, I mean, part of probably the passion for, for becoming an employer and figuring out that I really liked it was some of that reality that, hey, you know, for me to have, some downtime and some time away from this creation, there, there were going to have to be resources in place to, for, for that to happen. Um, and so that that's, you know, was sort of always the intent.
Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's a really good point. I mean, you know, whether we do a million dollars in revenue or a hundred million dollars, uh, you know, we can, we can go broke doing both. <laughs> I mean, you know, if it costs us 101 million to do the hundred, I mean, it's just not a real successful, uh, is, that's not a real successful recipe. Um, so f- for us, um, there, there's certainly price systemization. I mean, there's kind of a margin that, you know, we say this is it, and then from there to somewhere above there, there's some latitude for the estimator to, to negotiate with and navigate around with. Um, but fortunately, we do, a, we, we, ha, we do a lot of relational work. We work with the same construction management firms, the, a lot of the same owners repeatedly. Um, and some of that stuff is just, I, I don't want to say it is not, the number doesn't matter, because that's not true. Um, it, it just, it is not a hard bid environment, if, if that makes sense. Um, and, then, and then the other part of that is, is you know, we try to sell on, on value. On, you know, if, if our price is higher, well, why do we think it should be higher? And can we communicate that? And are we dealing with people who appreciate that at the same level that we do, right? I mean, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a concept that Disney and Starbucks and Ritz-Carlton, have, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they figured this out long ago. You know, uh, you know, Disney knew that you could go there and spend, you know, unfathomable amounts of money and come back home with really no takeaway but a photograph, maybe a pair of Mickey Mouse ears. But they knew that you would sit a picture on your mantle of your family at Disney, and for the next six months when you were paying that credit card off, you'd stare at that picture and go, I'd absolutely do that again. And because of the experience. And so that is from a, uh, you know, from a, from a approach standpoint, you know, we're, we're wanting to always fine-tune the experience. I mean, we look at production on jobs as that. I mean, that, that is our opportunity to deliver an experience. And we don't, do we screw stuff up? Yeah, yeah, of course. Do we do it as well as I wish we did all the time? Absolutely not. Uh, but that is, the, that is the standard, and that's what we're trying to do, is create enough of an experience that differentiates us and that justifies a value that we see as, you know what we need to what we need to price work at to be successful. Does that answer that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so St. Simon's was was pretty linear. Uh, my wife is is from there. Uh, when I worked in Savannah, I had a lot of service contacts in St. Simon's and Brunswick area. Uh, and with family connection, we were just always there. And we were always kicking around in St. Simon's and Sea Island because of that. Like, I'd get a phone call from someone that we had worked with before in a previous life. And, and so uh, one day, Travis and I, my, my business partner Travis and I, were just like, you know, we ought to just open an office down there. And we were that naive. We were like, oh, it's just that easy. You'll just go open an office down there. Um, but we did. Um, there were a lot of similarities to Athens in that market. Um, there's a couple of big economic engines, just like the university system is here and healthcare is here. Sea Island and healthcare is the health system down there is the same, uh, and so there were there were there were a lot of similarities, which kind of falsely led us to think we really knew what we were doing with opening additional office locations. Um, we had an office down there for six seven years and then decided to to open an office in Charleston. Charleston was more of bigger market, had a lot of this type of work we like. We did a lot of, do a lot of historic renovation work, which Charleston certainly has a lot of, do a lot of tile and ornamental metal, slate, 
uh, has a lot of that type of stuff, and it has a heavy institutional presence. The medical universities there, the Citadel's there, College of Charles. I mean, it's just it had all the stuff we liked, uh, and we spent the first three years there just getting our ass kicked um, because it is just a much bigger market. And I knew this going in, but it just, you know, I failed to, to, to be good enough at navigating it. Island communities are hard. Uh, they're hard geographically. Uh, I knew this from Savannah. You know, someone who lives on Wilmington Island in Savannah, they have no reason to ever go to Pooler or Port Wentworth or, you know, pick a, you know, Isle of Hope. They're never going over to, you know, Pick, a, pick another, to, to, to Richmond Hill. And it just, it, it, geographically, their, their big city congestion and traffic because of historic downtowns and narrow this, and it's just hard. And Charleston is every bit of that. I mean, Charleston's got big city issues. I mean, traffic. Uh, it, it is, it, you know, it's a million plus people metro. I mean, it is not a little place anymore. And it was just we struggled to, to get our footing in those markets. Part of it was because we were a much more mature organization, and we went into Charleston and thought we would look like we did in Athens and St. Simons, but when we went into Charleston day one, we had contacts because of roof consultants, we had contacts because of construction management firms, we had contacts because of the manufacturers that, whose systems we put on, and day one, we were over there doing big work. No service work, no relationship building, None of the stuff that we knew and thought our mix would look like because it's what it looked like in Athens in the beginning and it's what it looked like in St. Simons in the beginning. And, you know, we turned around one, two years in and we're like, uh, we've got four or five really big customers, but we don't know anybody other than that. So, uh, fortunately, you know, again, in an effort of self-awareness, we, we kind of pivoted and said, look, I mean, let's get back to what we know works and who we want to be. And, um, you know, that, that's been a real, <laughs> a real good uh, transition over there. But it was hard. Yes, sir? What does your day-to-day -day look like now compared to when you started the business? You know, I'll probably imagine it was like day one. Yeah. Now, almost two years in, you have 100 employees. What do you do on a day-to-day basis? -day? How do you manage it? Try to stay out of the way. I mean, I... I it's very hard for me to be somewhere and not feel the need to contribute to conversation and tell them to do something a certain way or do this, not th that kind of stuff. Uh, and, for, and for several years, that was really wrecking us. Um, and nobody, nobody would say that to me as, a, as their employer, right? I mean, they, nobody was going to say, hey, Chad, uh, would you quit showing up for that meeting? Because, you know, when you say something, somebody listens, and it's kind of – you know, different from what I told them, and it just, you know, just wrecks the whole process. So uh, in, in the context of our leadership structure now, I'm, I'm what this book and, and, and the day-to-day and, and uh, -day responsibilities refer to as our visionary. Uh, I spend my time thinking about, like, the next opportunity, uh, a, a, another market, a, another, another big institutional customer. Um, I still... Uh, because of my risk management degree, I, I, I love the insurance side of what we do. Uh, so I, st I still deal with that. Uh, uh, our insurance structure is a little different. Um, and, I, and, I, and so that gives me some connection to what's going on. Um, and then I am just more of the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the eye on improvement. Like, what, where, are we, where are we missing the mark? What can we do to improve our process? What can we do to be a better version of ourselves in a, in a particular area? Uh, that's, the, that's the things that I spend all my time thinking about. And then, you know, uh, inevitably, you know, big problems. Vendor relations still do that. Any other questions? Uh, oddly enough, that is like right on time. I think we have five minutes before uh, before we're supposed to officially be out of here. Yes, sir.
vision or do you feel like there's a transition coming to your company or do you think that the market will sustain themselves and uh, anybody who wants to be a software assistant can also keep going? Yeah, I think um, yes to all of that. I mean, so, so sort of my... Um, my intent and kind of my message has always been 10 years from now, I just want to have all the options on the table. Uh, whether that means transition to, you know, out and some version of that transition to our key employees, sure. I mean, my kids are 13 and 11, oldest is a girl, youngest is a boy, I, I, who knows. I, I, I don't know that I'd want them to get into the roof. You know, who knows? I don't know. So, uh, but but certainly, if that were down the road an opportunity, I would I would absolutely embrace that if it was something they wanted to do. Um, uh, you know, if PE or someone wanted to come in and say, "Hey, with our capital, will you tell us how to do what y'all have done in three markets in 30? Uh, sure. I mean, you know, we could. There, there's a need for what we do everywhere. Um, I don't know that we would ever look that uh, on that large of a level otherwise. Um, we talk about another location. Um, you know, Charleston is five years old for us. It's, it's kind of turned the corner and uh, has, a lot of, has a lot of really good uh, things going for it right now, and it's taken that amount of time to, to get it there. I mean, it's taken five years. Um, so we would certainly consider another market. But again, I, 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 have, just, I have just always said, I, I just want to get to a point, and that point is 10 years from right now, where all of those things, you know, if, if, if I didn't want to do anything but not show up anymore and still get a check, if we wanted to transition it and there was an opportunity just to have the, you know, to be healthy enough and in a place to be able to, you know, have all the, have all the options on the table. Anything else? Gino Wickman, Traction, uh, 180 pages. It's a, uh, just a great read. Um, it has, again, been the framework and structure that has allowed us to, you know, take what we do and grow it and scale it at a, um, at a much higher level than we ever thought we would be able to. And um, offline, I am more than happy to talk to anybody about what that journey has looked like and kind of the implementation of it and um, just just let me know. So thank you all. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. From here, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, is it, Get a Grip is, uh, is about the actual like case study, right? Yeah, so Get a Grip is a book that was written by the same author that they actually walk the process through with an organization. So, like, not only are you getting the, you know, getting all the terminology and all the systematic stuff that comes with imp implementing a, uh, an operating system, you're getting how it went as they implemented it in this organization. So, pretty, uh, pretty good read. So, thank you all very much. And uh, enjoy the remaining time here, and uh, see you soon.